Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 48. Working for a living or not. <laughs> that was good. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my insightful and entertaining co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. Hello, dear. How are you this week? I am doing okay. How are you? Uh, survived the first full week back from yeah, vacation. Yeah, doesn't it stink being an adult? Yeah, this whole <laughs> working five days a week is just for the birds. Yeah, yeah. I think everybody had a hard time between the kids, you know, being back at school for a full week and, yeah. you know. Not fun. No, Not, not nearly no. as fun as being on vacation. Yeah, that is true. So we've got a pretty full show today. We are mm-hmm. back in uh, our swing of things here. So in our Disney Detective segment, we're going to talk about getting paid, ironically enough, to visit theme parks. And not getting paid. <laughs> and and not getting paid by Disney, which... We got the yin and the yang that, of it. <laughs> that's really not that surprising that Disney wants you to do something for free. Right, right. Uh, we'll talk about... Um, Disney streaming and uh, what kind of money they're bringing in from that. Uh, then we will talk in our entertainment news with some Batman news. Oh, I'm sorry, wait, some Batman news. That was good. That was good. Uh, then, ironically enough, some Christian Bale news. <laughs> Do you like um, how I tied that together? That was, that was good. good. That was good. Yeah. Uh, so he'll be joining Thor, and I'm sure they'll give him some raspy voice role. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, American Horror Story yeah, has been renewed. We'll talk about that. And then we have our insightful picks of the week. Uh, that's the show today. We ready to get going? Sure, let's All do right, it. Here we go. Go for Disney Detective. So this was something that's been popping up and... Various different uh, news outlets have been talking about it. So there is a travel agency in the United Kingdom called Ocean Florida, and they are actually looking to hire a theme park tester. So the lucky person that would land the job uh, would get paid about $3,900 to travel to the theme parks throughout Florida. So that includes Walt Disney World, Universal, SeaWorld, basically to test and fully experience everything from rides to fireworks and shows to the tastiest of foods and the cuddly cuddliest of the characters. Um, The job will basically take place from three weeks sometime in April and May. Um, And while you're on this journey, you're going to basically be um, documenting your experience, the quality of the food, the thrill factor of the rides and the shows. Um, You know, they want you to post photos and videos on social media and keep a a daily uh, video diary. Um, In addition to the salary, um, all travel costs, including hotel, park tickets, will actually be covered. And you'll also get a daily budget along with a GoPro camera and a Fitbit to measure your steps and your heart rate. Um, You have to be 18 years or older to apply, and you have to answer a a series of questions. uh, And the deadline to submit the application is actually January 31st. So if you go to uh, ocean hyphen uh, florida.co.uk backslash theme park tester. Uh, you can go and apply if you're interested. I did see uh, or hear one thing that it's um, if you get picked, you're allowed to bring a guest with you to experience it. Um, the other thing is uh, they're supposed to be setting up your fast passes for you and photo passes so you kind of get to experience, you know, everything. 
um, you know, to the the best that they can do. So, you know, kind of interesting if you have, you know, nothing to do for three weeks and you want to get paid and so go to theme parks. So how much are they actually paying them? $3,900. So $3,900 plus travel expenses. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's not too bad. A little curious what the whole deal is with the Fitbit, though. Well, I guess they want, you know, I, I guess, you know, to kind of see how many steps you do, is that, you know, in a day. Or is that proof that you're actually doing Well, the I'm parts. sure part of it is, is proof. Well, the thing is you have to take photos. You have to do a video blog. You So there's the... The visual, but you can fake that. You well, can, you can grab people's photos and sure, um, you them. know. But if you have to be in the photo or, or something, yeah. you know, you know. But but I'm sure there's probably something that says, you know, oh, you know, average day spent in the park, you walk this many steps. Or so, what you is know. the purpose of this? Is this to? It's their travel. They're you know updating their travel site. But it, I guess my question is: Is this for? Marketing purposes? Is this for review purposes? For review purposes. Okay. Yeah, it's basically for, you know, they want to have some, and it doesn't say that you have to be from the United States or it doesn't have to, you know, it didn't say that you already have to be here, you know, because the the website is set up for somebody in the UK, right, basically, right. you know. Well, that's to, funny. You would think if it was somebody in the US, the travel expenses would be lower. a lot cheaper and, you know, that they'd want somebody from the US because they wouldn't have to pay, right. you know, for, you know, anything overseas. But, hey, yeah. good luck to anybody that, Did you, you know. Did you apply? No, I didn't. Not yet? Well, I don't know. We'll see. You got but, enough time. But see, my thing off. is I don't do thrill rides. So that's... For an all-expenses-paid trip, you might. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Rise of the Resistance was was like, kind of like my is limit. Is there criteria so. that you have to go on a certain I'm, number of rides? I'm guessing without... You, know, you probably need to go on like if every ride. If they're setting up your fast pass ride, you have to go on every ride they set up for you. I right, assume. right. And, and that's yeah. the thing is I could see... You know, because most, you know, travel books gives you a, you know, description of each and every ride. So I'm guessing if you're there for three weeks, you're probably spending multiple days in... Each park. Well, that's the thing. So the, You've got multiple parks. Right. I mean, Disney alone's got four parks right. plus the water parks. Right. Right. So I could see. Included. Yeah. So I could see spending. You know, you got have two or three days in this park, two or three days in this park, and maybe that's even part of the review saying you don't need a full day in this park, or yeah. you do need multiple days. You I mean, know. You, we could burn three three weeks just in Disney. Oh, absolutely. Parks, yeah, and I'm so. sure you know, and it's and it's you know it, it's. Sea World and you know Universal with their two parks, and I'm sure you know probably even Legoland. You know maybe even some of the smaller attractions Holy might Man? even. <sighs> Not the Holy Land. What? He really, really wanted to go when we were down there for Christmas. Really wanted to go, and I just yeah we couldn't. I want to go for Easter and see the live crucifixion. Is it every year? So. If anybody out there has ever been to Holy Land, please message us and 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 let us know because uh, Holy Land experience. I Orlando, just Florida. I don't even know. I guess it's still open. I don't know. We never even really looked. We just kind of. So like when they do like <laughs> like like you go to Disney, and you get announcements in the park. Is it like the voice of? God doing the announcements of the Holy Land. <laughs> that would be funny. Or Charlton Heston. Or you know, does like the that. water like you know turn to to blood? You know, right. do you have a button right. like the water fountains? You walk water across wine, the parking water lot wine, when it's raining wine. and the puddles just part for you. <laughs> That's so, so bad. Anyway, we done. Anyway, okay, we're done with that. <laughs> so Disney streaming, tell us uh, about that. So Disney streaming business is already worth more than a hundred billion alone. Investors believe. Uh, so they're. Business is being, you know, valued by investors at more than $100 billion, according to an, uh, an estimate by Barclays, uh, showing that the investors have high confidence less than two months after Disney Plus has already launched. Um, you know, so, in, in, you know, in just six weeks, Disney has already uh, priced in the streaming business worth $10 billion, 69% uh, of Netflix's uh, enterprise value basically took them 13 years to kind of, you know, get there. Um, and Disney has a market cap of about 200, 
260 billion dollars, while Netflix is at about 144 billion. Um, you know, so obviously Netflix debuted on November uh, in November, gaining more than 10 million subscribers on its first day. And of course, you know, there have been speculations as to how many of those were paid and how many of those Disney Plus debuted, not Netflix. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. Disney Plus debuted. Netflix, it's been a lot longer. Um, but as you know, we've talked about before, you know, they really haven't come out with how many of those 10 million subscribers were actually paid subscribers since Verizon and a couple of other things, you know, were out there to give you, you know, free memberships, you know, for, for so many years. Um, but, you know, now they're, as of October, Netflix had 156 million subscribers gl- globally with more than 60 million in the United States. Now, I know, I don't know if it's launched in the UK yet, because I know it was supposed to be a couple of months. Disney Plus, you know, wasn't launching everywhere yet. Um, Yeah, they were supposed to be staggering it out across various countries. Right. So, you know, so you figure a lot of, you know, and obviously we know that there were a lot of people who once the Mandalorian was over, you know, they dropped their subscription and they'll probably, you know, re-up sometime. And that's you know. the numbers that I'd like to see. So right. one is, what are your numbers now that the Mandalorian season's over? You figure you're probably still going to have uh, maybe a month or two as people might binge watch it. That's right. I would just to binge it. Right. But the other thing is, you know, they're comparing these to Netflix's numbers. And the marketplace is significantly different. You know, mm-hmm. when, when Netflix launched... Netflix didn't have a streaming service. No, it you was... You didn't have streaming services. Right, it was all DVD rentals. Right. So it was... And you were, at the time, you were competing with traditional video rental places. Right, you had so Blockbuster and everybody. it was a completely different marketplace. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, the way that this article is kind of worded is like they're trying to take something away from Netflix. Well, Netflix is who started the entire streaming mm-hmm. genre itself. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and and the other thing we were talking about yesterday is, you know, Disney Plus doesn't have a lot of original content. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of it's back backlog stuff. Right, right. And the original content that they have is trickled out mm-hmm. like a regular TV season. Mm-hmm. Netflix drops everything at once. Right, right. And when Netflix drops something, they've got something else in the wings waiting to drop right. after you've done that. So right. Netflix has done a very good job stringing people from series to series to right, series. Right, right. And I don't think Disney has really perfected that at this point. Yes and no, because it was funny because we were actually a friend of mine at, at work who he, you know, he's a big Mandalorian fan as well. And he even said that in some ways he felt that Disney was a little bit smarter with doing the releasing, you know, one per week, because then you could actually build up more buzz over a longer period of time yes, and I as agree. opposed to Netflix dropping something and somebody spending a weekend and being, you know, like Stranger Things dropped, you know, over uh, July 4th weekend and... You know, right. and then it was done. And then you're like, okay, well, now I got to wait another year no, and a half. No, I agree. And that's why I don't you know. like binge watching this stuff when it first dropped. Right. The other interesting thing with Disney was their free period mm-hmm. was only seven days. Right. Where Netflix so is usually. Even if they had dropped everything, mm-hmm. it'd be very difficult. Like even now, if you sign right. up for seven days. Right. And you're going to try and binge watch the entire season of something. It's very difficult to do that in the course of seven days. Right, right. So it's, you know, it's kind of like a nice mix of of the two to be able to, you know, like look at, you know, we we watched um, The Expanse. We didn't necessarily binge watch it. We watched one episode per day for a couple of days, a couple of days off from it. And now we're done. Yeah. And they're just starting to go and film, you know, season five. So yep. we know we have, you know, a while where at least with The Mandalorian, that took us two months 
to, you know, yeah. to kind of stretch out and, and watch. But again, there's so much content out there now. Um, you know, one of the, the radio sta- stations that I listened to, they were even talking about it. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, like you don't even want to recommend stuff to people because there's just so much out there that, you know, pretty much everybody already has their list of, okay, once I'm done with this, I'm going to go to this now, and then I'm going to go mm-hmm. to this, and then, you know, and like, you know, I was even saying to you, hey, are you interested in watching, you know, this? And you're like, eh, maybe, you know, so it'll probably be one of those things, like, I'll start watching it, you'll kind of look and go, oh, that doesn't look so bad, maybe I'll come watch yeah, it. Yeah, and that's... And it, you know, we'll we just kind of move on to the next thing. And there certainly isn't a shortage of... uh Mm-hmm. Content out there. In fact, if anything, it's it's gotten to the point where there's too much there's good stuff too out much, there, mm-hmm. and it's spread over too many services. Like I'm not going to subscribe right. to all these services, and that's and that's the other problem too. Is I'm wondering if there's going to be something, you know, like a, a Hulu type thing that's going to you know pick like instead of it being you know, and I guess you can kind of do that you know with. Um, you know, like Amazon or whatever, where you can just buy a season, you know, of something. And and it almost seems like that's what somebody needs to to develop so that like, okay, well, I don't want to get, you know, the CBS app, you know, but I want to watch Picard. You know, I don't want to watch anything else. And I want... That's a good example because CBS has Star Trek. Right. And when the first Star Trek came out on their Discovery, Mm -hmm. I had absolutely no desire to watch it. Right. The card's coming out on there now. So now there's almost a compelling reason, but it's, I'm not going to get a streaming service for one show. Right. There's nothing else that they have that I want. Right. So, you know, how much would it be once the season comes out to buy just, you know. And this this is where a a service like what Apple's done for Mm -hmm. news and magazines and stuff like that comes into play where. Right. I can buy a single service. Right. Everybody gets a cut that that services that, and I can go in and pick and choose the things that I want to right. actually watch. Right. And that's what I'm saying. That's w- you need something like you know uh, the the gateway that right. okay you like watching Stranger Things we're gonna take that you like watching The Mandalorian we're gonna take that you like you know. Mrs. Maisel, we're going to take that and, you know, one from each and bundle it and as a little it's thing. it's funny because, you know, for the longest time, people have wanted their cable to be a la carte where I can right. pick the channels I want. And yeah, and now they have And streaming is taking that. it from that mm-hmm. to a whole nother granular level of, yeah. well, I don't want the channels. I just want these shows these from shows. these channels. Well, yeah, like with Outlander, I'm still, you know, a season behind because we changed the way our cable was. Right. And, and with Xfinity, you couldn't just have the Stars app or, or whatever. And I basically was waiting for the season to end so that I could go back and get it on an app of some sort. And I still, you know, haven't done that. But now Netflix is starting to pick it up. But of course, there's still, you know, a season or so, you know, behind. So it's like, well, do I just wait another year? Right. Or do I, like, all right, let me just pay, you know, for that one series because that was really the only thing, you know, I'd watch. So yeah, yeah. so that's what We're it's. We're at a very uh, interesting time mm-hmm. with streaming now where it's. It's still trying to figure itself out. Mm-hmm. And it's funny to think back, you know, what, maybe 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, when we had the writer strike and, you know, there were all these great shows that we were watching at the time that just fell to the wayside, yeah. you know, because of, of everything and, and they never went back to them. You had the whole, you know, few years where reality TV, uh. you know, came in and that was all that was there. And now we're at like this great time where there's there's too much to watch. It's the like successful <laughs> that is reality TV. We don't have enough falls time. <laughs> squarely on the writer strike. Right, you know, and, and it's like I can't go to work today. I have to stay home and yeah. watch television and catch up. Well, so. speaking of work, maybe if you worked for Disney for nothing, maybe you could watch TV. Why don't you tell us about that one? Um, so this was something that uh, Disney had actually started back in 2008. Uh, they kind of wanted to start their own little panel. Uh, so they had called it the Disney Parks Mom Panel. And what they did was they had uh, an application where you could go. And basically, if you were the type of person that always helped everybody plan a vacation, 
you know, they wanted your help, you know, basically, you know, instead of going to a travel agent and, and you know, getting information, uh, you know, from them, they kind of wanted their own little group of, of, of people. Um, and it was kind of at the start of the, the social media, you know, craze and, and stuff like that. Um, I applied a, a couple of different times and, um, you know, never made it through uh the, the different uh, areas. Um, but each year I've known one or two uh, Disney friends from Facebook who have actually, you know, made it to the panel and, and whatnot. Um, so the first year it was just 12 members. And basically the idea was you went on the website and you could ask a question like, hey, I'm staying at such and such a resort. What's, you know, the closest place to you know, whatever to get something to eat, you know, do I need a car, you know, can I get, you know, uh, assistance at the park, or, you know, I'm traveling with a family for the first time, or I'm traveling with my grandparents, where do you suggest? Um, so they're kind of consultants, I guess you could say, because they don't get paid, it's it's strictly a volunteer position. Um, and every year, they get about 10,000 applicants. Um, and each member has some sort of specialty, whether it's the cruise line or vacation, cl Disney Vacation Club, uh, Disneyland, Disney World, even um, the, the international parks, um, you know, as well. And it was something that, you know, they just kind of started and it just kind of grew, you know, every year. Um, so this year there were um, 13 members, uh, 11 which are women, and they actually started adding dads. So even though it's the mom's panel, there are dads that are uh, on the panel as well. Um, and then what they do is even though they have like the new class each year, they have previous panelists who volunteer to, to help out as well. So you have, you know, so this year there's an, uh, 28 panelists from previous years that came back to kind of help, you know, answer, you know, questions, you know, that, that anybody has, um, uh, about, you know, staying in the Disney parks or the cruise lines or, you know, anything, uh, you know, related to, to Disney. Um, so obviously, you know, millions of people visit Disney annually, um, you know, and sometimes you, you, you know, your travel agent might not know the answers, but these are people that, you know, love Disney, have a love of Disney, have been to Disney, you know, multiple times, have stayed, you know, multiple places, you know, they're kind of the, you know, the experts of, you know, where to stay and, and what to do and, and give you, you know, some ideas. Um, so again, uh, the, the newest class just just started. Um, and it's been going since, you know, 2008. Um, you know, some of the criteria is that you aren't a travel agent that, you know, because they don't want you uh, having a um, conflict of interest, you know, with it. So, you know, and they have a questionnaire, it's, you know, how many times have you been? Where have you stayed? You know, tell us about your last, you know, visit and, and things like that. Um, so, you know, it, it's kind of cool. And, and what's really cool is, um, the one person that's on the panel um, I've been friends with on, on Facebook for a number of years now, and she's always been so positive, like, okay, everybody ready to apply? And, you know, each year, you know, she never made it. I think one or two years she made it to, like, the second round and didn't make it, but was always, you know, one day I'll get it, one day I'll get it. And this year she's on, you know, this year's panel. So that was kind of cool to, so to see. are there permanent uh, positions on the panel, or do they always change? They always change. They're now back in the day. I'm sure it's the same. There's you know somebody that like oversees the whole panel, and they're a Disney employee, and then everybody else that you know that answers questions on the panel. It's all you know volunteer. They're all people that had you know one. And is it all one year term? <clears throat> it's usually one year term, and then again, like I said, some people do get asked to come back, you know, the following year or maybe even a couple years later. Because I know I have another Disney Facebook friend who she was on it a couple of years ago, took like a year or two off, and then they asked her, "Hey, would you be interested in in coming back?" So, you know, you're specifically the class of whatever, but then you might, you know, fill in, you know. Over time, you Can know. Can you apply to be on it again after the mm -hmm. one year? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Very cool. Uh, and that is it for Disney Detective. Yep. Let's move on to entertainment news. T 
tell us about the Batman. <laughs> well, we don't know if he's going to talk like that, because don't forget, this is like the younger Batman. Like, you know, not... Um, this is pre pre no, Batman? No, this is like, I just got out of college, and I'm not really sure what to do with my life. Like, late 20s, early 30s, maybe, Batman? I'm not and sure. He, and he decides to put a mask on and fight crime. I don't know. We haven't figured it out yet. I guess everybody's so, got a hobby. So, the Batman director, Matt Reeves, has now confirmed that Colin Farrell will be penguin um after months of speculation the batman director was you know had actually confirmed that he would be playing penguin in the 2021 reboot he uh tweeted a gif of farrell um from uh on monday with the caption wait is that you oz and oz being the shortened form of the given name of the DC character Oswald Cobblepot. Uh, so he tweeted, you know, similar gifts when, you know, other actors uh, joined the project. So he was uh, first rumored back in November um, to be cast in this, but now it's obviously confirmed. And he joins, obviously, Robert Pattinson, who's going to be the crepe, Cape Crusader. Not, uh, the, not the Crepe Crusader? <laughs> Crepes. Mmm, crepes. Creepy paper. <laughs> Creepy paper. <laughs> uh, Paul Dano uh, as the Riddler, uh, Zo Zoe Kravitz as Catwoman, Jeffrey Wright as Commissioner Gordon, and Peter Skarsgård in a mystery role that we still don't know. Um, and obviously Pattinson is taking over for Ben Affleck to obviously starred in two DC films. Um and appeared in another as Batman. Um, and obviously this is slated to be in theaters June 25th of 2021. So they're having at least three bad guys in this movie. Mm -hmm. Didn't they see like the second all or the other third version of, of Spider-Man and all those really bad Batman ones where they put too many villains in? No, I don't know. No. <sighs> okay, anyway. Maybe it's setting it up for, you know... Something else, maybe they're, you know, they're not in it, you know, maybe it's just to kind of tease, because aren't they See, supposed now, to be doing more than if one they movie? Had, if they had cast Paul Dano as Commissioner Gordon, then you could have the line, book him, Dano. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <sighs> okay, moving right along, tell us about Christian Bale. So from one Batman to another, so it seems that Christian Bale is in talks to join Marvel's Thor, Love and Thunder. Uh, he's in talks to join the Marvel Cinematic Universe and join uh, Chris Helmsworth in Thor, Love, and Thunder. Uh, the rap actually had confirmed this. Uh, obviously, the last time that he wore superhero spandex was in the Dark Knight trilogy. Uh, when you talk like this, <laughs> for no apparent reason. Maybe maybe it was dusty or something. I'm Batman. And had something in his in his throat. I do this because I try to sing opera and now my voice <laughs> sounds like this. Are you done? Anyway, go ahead. Uh so uh <laughs> ta uh Taika Watiti will return to write and direct. Um, and the filmmaker directed the third film in the installment, which was Thor Ragnarok. Um, and also, for the record, directed the season finale of The Mandalorian. Yes, he did that as well. And is the voice of IG-11. And... Used to be, well. Well, until... No spoilers. No spoilers. <laughs> Uh, so the plot obviously still remains under wrap, but in Avengers Endgame, as the film was wrapping up, one moment of, you know, levity, basically, when, when everything was going on, that, you know, Thor was leaving, you know, New Asgar, you know, on Earth, and basically hitched a ride with the Guardians of the Galaxy, and called it the Asgardians of the Galaxy. Um, so now it's like, hmm, where's he end up? you know, in the, this whole thing. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I don't think they had a date yet. Oh, no, they do. Thor, uh, Love and Thunder will be hitting theaters November, 2021. Wow. That's a ways off. Yeah. Still got a ways to go. Cool. 
Tell us about American Horror Story. So this I don't have a voice for this, but no, you don't, because there, there's so many. So I'm obviously a fan. I've I've talked about it, um, you know, a couple of different times. So American Horror Story is not going away anytime soon. It seems that the award-winning anthology series has just been renewed for three additional seasons. Uh, it was previously renewed for a tenth season, which is slated to air sometime in 2020. Usually, it starts back in. Uh, September, October time frame. Um, but now it seems that because of the success of the ninth installment, which by far was probably my favorite season, 1984, now they've been extended to at least 13 seasons. Um, so during its run, American Horror Story has featured a very eclectic cast from Jessica Lange, uh, Sarah Paulson, Billy Lord, Evan Peters, um, while exploring different classic horror themes, you know, between haunted houses an insane asylum, the witchy, you know, deep south, a murderous campground, you know, the freak show environment, like every season has been, you know, different. I think that's what keeps it kind of fresh. And, you know, they're able to, to, you know, keep doing it, you know, years after years. Um, the series actually has been nominated for a total of 95 Emmys and has actually won 16 over the years. Um, so obviously no details about season 10 have been revealed um the only thing that you know came out you know a couple of months ago was that you know the witches will be back that was all that 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 ryan murphy uh had hinted at um so you know a lot of people that was their favorite season and and even uh the season apocalypse had some of the witches you know come back so he kind of you know he uses obviously a lot of the same actors uh in different roles sometimes even in uh, similar roles and usually you know there's some sort of easter egg from one season you know to another so you know as I'm sure as filming starts there'll be you know speculations as to to what it is but cool. you know I'm excited so in a uh, separate but somewhat related I was reading an article this week uh, and they were talking about Billy Lord mm -hmm. who was Carrie Fisher's daughter right uh, actually was the person who played Carrie Fisher in the flashback scene in Rise of Skywalker. Oh, okay. It was Leia and Luke fighting. Huh. And they digitally imposed Leia's face on top of her body. Wow, how cool is so that? They said they had to get somebody. Right. And they thought it would be very appropriate if Billy Lord played that role. That's cool. So I That's going to that get was, me all misty-eyed now. Yeah, thought that was kind of neat. That's cool. Uh, so that's it for entertainment news. We'll yep. come back with our insightful picks of the week. Okay. So go for your insightful pick, dear. So my insightful pick is a show that we actually had talked about a couple weeks before that uh, we, we mentioned was going to be coming to Netflix. And it is the series Dracula. Uh, it's a three-part series. Blah. See, I have a voice for that one. Oh, goodness. And I live with him, people. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, um, so it was actually aired on BBC One over uh, a three-night stint. Um, and now it has dropped to Netflix. It's th just three episodes because it's uh, you know the typical uh, BBC show where Very it's Sherlockian. You know, yes. Three really long episodes. Right. Each episode is an hour and a half, and I've only actually watched one so far. <laughs> so you want to talk about binge watching? That's that's a really long time to to be be watching. Um, so it was actually developed, as you mentioned, very Sherlockian, um, by uh, Mark Gaddis and Stephen Moffat, also of Doctor Who fame. Um, and it's based on the novel of the same name by Bram Stoker. Uh, it was released, obviously, like I said, by BBC One and is the three episodes. Um, it, you know, it follows Dracula from his origins in Eastern Europe to his battles with Van Helsing's descendants and beyond. So, you know, it's not the typical Van Helsing. It's a little bit of a twist on it. So do we see Hugh Jackman as Van Helsing in this one? No, mm. that really would have been awesome. Yeah. So it, it's... With it's, his automatic crossbow? <laughs> 
that would be cool. Um, so I, like I said, I've only seen the the first episode. You know, it definitely has that that Sherlock wit. You know, like oh my god, did he just say that? Like what? You know, rewind, see it again. Um, the special effects are pretty freaky. It's it's it has a lot of that old school horror feel to it but yet you know some of the the newer modern slasher type thing um you know dracula the you know he's very charismatic but you're like eh, he's kind of creepy you know so it's it, it 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 it's based off of the book but you know a little bit different you know Is it is it set in modern times? Or? No, it's set, you know, 1800s okay. and, and everything like that, you know, and the part that I saw, you know, is set modern, you know, 1800s or whatever. So you don't, it hasn't gone back back to like Dracula's, um, you know, start, but I don't know. That's good because if... origin stories never work out well. <laughs> right. You know, it basically starts off with, you know, Harker is in um you know in uh in a nunnery um hospital type thing and it's like well wait a second harker wasn't the one that was that that was renfield if you know so it, it it's interesting so it's different but it's not you know so i'm looking forward to 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 finishing it up um and again it's only you know the three episodes so you know but again each one is an hour and a half so it's like watching you know three separate movies but very well done you know i'm definitely interested in continuing it and finishing it up cool good pick thank you <laughs> So my pick this week, um, much to my surprise, is not a documentary. No, I was actually um, very surprised. This happened to be one that I watched while we were on vacation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and in fact, I started watching it. I saw the preview, was fascinated by it, started watching it and, and was hooked in the first 10 minutes of it. And that is The Two Popes streaming on Netflix. So The Two Popes is a 2019 biographical drama um, starring Anthony Hopkins as Pope Benedict the Sixteenth and Jonathan Price as Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio, who would take on the title of Pope Francis. Say um, that three times fast. Yeah, well, I, I didn't have a voice for it, so I kind of had to stop. <laughs> oh, okay, it. all right. Uh, the movie depicts key events that happened after the death of Pope John Paul II, which leads to the election of German Cardinal Joseph Ratzing Ratzinger as Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, mm -hmm. um, There's a portrayal of the more fundamentalist Vatican tendencies of Ratzinger, uh, who's a traditionalist and wanted to go so far as to return to Latin services, and Bergoglio, uh, who was a reformer and a modernist. Um, much of the film revolves around uh, Bergoglio's frustrations with the church. Uh, he actually, after Pope John Paul II, uh, had passed away was the second highest in votes for uh, secession. Oh, okay. Ratzinger won it. So I didn't realize that there was a lot of attention that was given to him. Uh, and he's uh, an archbishop from Brazil. So, you know, the fact that he's not a traditionalist, he's not from the regular, mm -hmm. you know, European uh, crux of, of where they tend to get their popes from was kind of a big deal. Um, so he had to go to Ratzinger to get his approval. He was frustrated because of the direction that Ratzinger was going with the church. And, uh, a lot, there was a whole, it, it's the interesting thing was how the politics mm -hmm. of the Pope work and the right. church work. And there's basically political parties and you had progressives and you had, conservatives and the progressives were hoping to move the church into something that was a little bit more modern. And when Ratzinger was elected, a lot of those progressives wound up getting frustrated. Bergoglio being one of them, he wanted to retire and just go run a parish somewhere. Right. And he had to go to Rome in order to do that because mm. apparently if you're below a certain age, you need the Pope's permission. So he goes to the movie depicts him going to Rome <laughs> Um, <laughs> and what's really interesting, he books a flight to go. 
Okay. Then after his flight is booked to go talk to him about retiring, he's contacted by the Pope and summoned to Rome. And he assumes he's being summoned for the same thing. Okay. Well, he gets to Rome and he's being summoned for something completely different. Okay. Uh, Ratzinger's trying to basically feel him out because Ratzinger knows at this point he wants to step down. And he knows he's the the number one guy for, you know, to replace succession. Him. Um, but what was really interesting about it was the, the story itself delves less into the politics about the Catholic Church. And it's, it's there. You can't get away from it. But more about the relationship that these two men develop, mm. um, where they're two diametrically opposed people. Mm -hmm. And through the course of these uh discussions and and meetings and and you know having dinner together you know cuz you know at one point in time they highlight the fact that uh pope benedict eats alone in this massive palace mm -hmm. and and uh pope francis he's the kind of guy who goes down to the local pub to watch soccer cuz he's a huge soccer fan okay. and he loves being around other soccer fans right fans. right so just the the differences between mm -hmm. these two and how they both sort of come around to each other and they find common ground. Mm -hmm. um, and what kind of struck me as interesting about the movie is you could really pull these two characters out and stick them in any context. It has doesn't have to be, you know, the Catholic Church or Popes or whatever. And take two people that are very different from each other, have different philosophies, and let them develop this relationship. And in the end, ultimately what happens is they sort of celebrate each other's differences. Mm. And they learn to compromise. They learn to respect the differences between each other. And they don't, they don't necessarily compromise their own philosophies, but they find a way to work together. And it's a great message, given all of the conflict that we see today. Mm -hmm. It's a great message that works in today's world. Hmm. Um, it, this just happened to be themed with... You know, based on real events and, and right, themed around right. the Catholic Church. But if people had, you know, this, because Ratzinger was totally closed minded at the beginning of this. Mm -hmm. And and Bergoglio was so charismatic and, and so persistent that he was able to not win him over, but at least let make him look at a different perspective. Okay. Um, so it was done very well, um, regardless of, of what your religious leanings are. Uh, it's definitely a decent movie to take a look at. Uh, and that's The Two Popes streaming now on Netflix. Very cool pick. So that was what I had. Did we have anything else for the show today, my yeah, dear? Yeah, there were a couple of things that I just wanted to kind of put out there because we're kind of coming up on um, Comic-Con, toy show season. You know, January is kind of quiet, and then all of a sudden, boom, it starts. So I figured, you know, for anybody that's kind of local uh, to our, you know, viewing area, you know, just kind of put these out there. These are uh, ones that we've done, you know, before. So just to kind of, you know... Put it in your mind. Uh, the first one is ZoloCon, uh, which is actually... ZoloCon. I was waiting for that. Um, which is February 8th and 9th. Uh, it is a comic and toy convention. Um, the largest comic show, comic uh, and toy show in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. I'm not really sure that's saying much. Uh, well, yeah. Well, that's just what they bill it at. Um, general admission is $15 on Saturday and $5 for kids. And Sunday, it's $10 and kids are free. The one thing about this, not only is it just a cool show to go to because they the have venue. a little bit of everything they even have some cosplay you know players there sometimes they'll be you know one or two vehicles outside but it really is the venue that has probably been our biggest draw yeah. and in some ways it kind of hurts it because like the one main room is kind of small and it's round so you kind of you know have to go in you know circles but then you kind of go upstairs that you don't think you're supposed to be going so upstairs why is it round cuz it's um a centrifuge a centrifuge that was used by NASA yeah. um and actually if you go to the website which is rentthefugue.com 
backslash about, you can actually read all the yeah. history about it. And that's what's really cool because while you're walking through, they have, you know, different things for you to look at. They actually rent the place out for like weddings yeah. and and so that would be really cool. Like if we ever decided to like get married again or something, let's, you know To each other or to, to someone else. Well, I don't know. It's up to you. Mm. Whatever. <laughs> Renew our vows or something. So um, the venue is cool. It's the right. venue's called the Fuge. There's this massive centrifuge that's still there. Right. You you walking around and you're looking up and you're like, yeah. dude. <laughs> it's a facility that was used both by NASA and the Air Force, mm -hmm. uh, and was instrumental in testing, uh, G-force testing for hyper uh, sonic test flights. Right. And uh, you can. Go up there and see what the control room looks like and everything. Yeah, yeah. So we've we've taken pictures, you know, there. So it's it's usually two levels of, of a show floor. So you have the the main level that you kind of circle, you know, around. Then you go upstairs, and there's a couple of different rooms. Uh, they have a couple of vendors there selling food. Um, you know, there's a couple of places to eat in the area too. We're it's usually not an there. All day convention. It's, yeah, it's we're usually there for day. a couple of hours. Uh, you know, but again, it's the venue itself. I think the first time we went there because we weren't really sure what to expect, and we were like, "Oh my god, this is just really coolest place I've ever been <laughs> for a convention." This is kind of cool. And they do have like um, uh, uh, movie screens up. So sometimes they're you know the one year they were playing old uh, toy commercials yep. or they were doing like sci-fi movie old trailers sci -fi from movies, like the 1950s yep. so again just uh, you know it's a cool experience it's a cool experience to. you know sometimes we walk away with some good finds and you know sometimes uh, every this is one every time I've gone I've yeah, walked away with something do, good you do you 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 yeah, la, 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 I can't talk I'm so excited about it <laughs> Because it's less than a month away. No, you do usually find, you know, some interesting things. And they have vendors that, you know, are selling old toys or some that are making things. You know, so there, mm. there's a little bit of something there, you know, for everybody. Um, and it's in Westminster, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and we'll have, obviously, the information, you know, on the site. Um, then uh, the first, I guess, kind of big convention coming up is the great philadelphia comic con um this was one that we went to for the first time last year it had always been on our radar and but why it, is it great because they put it in the name because <laughs> they said so um and it's not the greater philadelphia comic con which i kept thinking it was but it's the great philadelphia comic con held at the greater philadelphia expo center which is in oaks pennsylvania um again this was one that had been on our radar for a number of years and it just always seemed to be going on while we were going to be on vacation so we always missed it last year was the first year that we went to it yep. we love going out to, to oaks it's a great venue it's nice and spacious you don't feel cramped that's actually where they do the dog show yeah uh that you watch you know on, on thanksgiving um Parking is free. Big, huge parking area. Of course, you might be walking miles to, to get to your car. Not really that much. Great pizza place in the area, too. Yep. Um, and this was actually where we went to one of the panels last year, and it was the stars the of Expanse. The Expanse. Yeah. So, you know, they do get top. And who do they have this year? I don't know. No, that's not. That's somebody else. That's oh, the other okay. one. <laughs> They're still announcing names for, oh, okay. for this one. Um, but this one is going to be, um, I'm sorry, April 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Um, if you go to their website, pricing is available. Pricing is kind of decent, um, you know, where we used to go to uh, Wizards, you know, in Philadelphia, where now, you know, the greater uh, the great Philadelphia Comic Con, you know, is almost half price for it. So it's you know, um, yeah, they have the Halo guys and the Halo guys, <laughs> the guys that do Halo. <laughs> I I saw that today when you know when when it came up. Yeah, f you know, they're still you know in the process, obviously of of doing Samurai Jack. <laughs> wow, that's a classic. Yeah. Um, so that was, again, one that we, um, you know, went to for the first time last year and we really enjoyed it. And, you know, we would, you know, definitely wanted to, to go back to that one. Um, and then obviously <clears throat> later in the summer, uh, towards the end of the summer, actually, August 28th through 30th at the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia is 
Keystone Comic Con. Um, and that, that's the one that has. Yes, that's the one that has. Dun, dun, dun. They're doing a original. Slow website. Slow website loading. They don't have. Guests. If you go to guests. Yes. View all guests. Possibly. View all guests. It's there. You just got to scroll down. <laughs> Their their website they was don't really sold. No, they don't. Do they even have it on their website? Well, they had it in an email, so they don't have it on the website. But they have it in uh, oh, comic entertainment guests. Entertainment guests. Oh, their website's terrible. Yeah, their website is not that great. Well, anyway, in an email. <laughs> They don't even have it up. They don't even have it up there. Are those the right dates? Yeah, those are the right Jeez. dates. But they're doing a original Star Trek cast reunion with George Takei, Walter Koenig, and... William Shatner. I, I wasn't sure if you were going to do that or not. So that's kind of cool. Um, you know, uh, so that was, again, one that I didn't even realize was was around. Last year we found out about yeah, it. A, we went to it. Gold mine last and, year. you know, again, it wasn't as big as some of the other ones, but it was definitely, you know, we spent, you know, a good portion of, of the day there. They had, you know, the a gaming area for the kids. They had cosplay. Um, they had wrestling stuff. The only thing bad I think that we had to, to say about that one last year was the food, was just that the line was really long. Yeah, they did you not know. do a very good job managing Yeah, that was really our demand. only complaint about it. The price was right. I think uh, the, the price for tickets, as long as you get them within two weeks of the show you get ten dollars off so you know really not that bad and again it was one that we definitely liked and we you know definitely wanted to to do it again so again because convention season is is starting i wanted to kind of just put out you know these couple of you know events because we always enjoyed them and you know figured share share the wealth so so their website's terrible it's still loading by the way <laughs> So if anyone from Keystone Comic Con is, is looking, you might want a new website. Yeah, you, you need, need to, to fix your, your website. So anyway, I think that was it for what we had, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's it. Uh, before we go, let's give out our contact info <laughs> so you can reach us via email. We'd love your comments at comments at insightsintothings.com. On Twitter at insights underscore things. On YouTube, you can catch our videos at youtube.com slash insights into things. Obviously on the web at www.insightsintothings.com. Or our audio podcast at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. Or on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. And I think that's all we've got. That's it. Another one in the books. Mm -hmm. We're out of here. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye.